you know, what can I say about Abner, right? Uh, I think this is your fourth or fifth time to be, I think so, to be here. But um, I actually, and those of you that have been here for a while, I think I've told this story, but I'll tell it again because I tell stories over and over. Um, I can't, I'm an old man, right? Um, but, you know, I met Abner and it was actually in, I think it was in Orlando, Florida at Voice of the Apostles and um, we had a mutual friend and we were talking and Abner just began to prophesy me that, to me there, prophesy to us before the service and told us we couldn't quit and that we were a, a gateway church and all those things, not like Robert Morris Gateway, but like Gateway in the state of Oklahoma and I, I can't remember what else, but it was very encouraging. It was very strategic. Um, he always uh, brings a great word of direction and encouragement when he comes. We just appreciate Abner and everything that he's doing. Amen. And so um, at this time, we just want to welcome him. Hallelujah. The glory of the Lord. Let the glory, let the face of the Lord shine up on us. Amen. So we just welcome Abner Suarez. Just welcome him as he comes to minister to us. So praise God. Thank you. Good morning. Great to be with you guys. Oklahoma. Did they win yesterday? Anyway, who cares? <laughs> I just <laughs> mess with you. I'm glad if they won for you. All right. This is the greatest time to be alive. How many of you know that? And um, if you don't know that, you sh we really are privileged to be alive during this time because of what God is doing. Uh, I don't believe that there's been another generation that has had the understanding that this generation has to do what God's called us to do. And there's a real spirit of revelation in the earth to apprehend what God is doing. And uh, with that, there's a high responsibility to fulfill God's purpose for our generation. Uh, David, Acts 13, it says, when David had served the purposes of God for his generation, then he died. And so I've learned that you don't get judged for the stuff you're doing. You get judged for what God asks you to do. And um, there you go. There's a story. Uh, I understood this. I believe the last day Oral Roberts <clears throat> was in the earth. And his son Richard came into his hospital room. He wasn't doing too well physically. And he's worshiping the Lord. And uh, Richard said, Dad, you're not doing too good. Why are you worshiping? He said, the Lord has told me I finished what he asked me to do in the earth. And he said, he's bringing me home. And that's a good way to finish. Yeah. Notice I didn't say die, because if you're in Christ, you never die. Yeah. Right. You just transition. And here, keep this one in mind. This is the shortest part of your existence. Like, it's like that. Now, I'm not going to claim to get old, be an old man like um, Andy. <laughs> I'm getting older, but I'm not aging. That's what I'm going with. And I'm going for 120. Because um, I got lots of things to do. And you can't do them in heaven. So, so I, I believe God has something for us. So we have a resource table back there. Do you know, uh, about three years ago, I was getting ready to minister in a conference. And I just had this thing that the Lord just was kind of rolling through my notes and just writing. And... Uh, one of the verses I was looking at was Matthew 28, and he said, uh, I, have, I still have a requirement of my people to disciple nations. And he says, just because it hasn't been done yet, I haven't changed my mind. And so you have to have a vision for where God wants to take the people of God. And uh, I believe we're going to see nations discipled. And it might not look like... Um, I think we have to, even when I say that, I think it's very careful. Like, it's not like us, like, let's take over. It's like, represent God. And I always ask myself, when people look at my life or when I, when I handle certain things that come my way, 
is it from God's perspective or do I use world system ideas to fix my problems? Because he has a solution for everything. You know, every, every, anything you're walking through, he's like, I can help. Right? You're like, I really screwed up. I can help. You're like, no, no, I really screwed up. I know, I can help. He's like all in on helping you. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I said this a few weeks ago, it's not God's problem. He actually wants to help you. So it's on us to adjust to his solution. And what, what I found walking with God too, it's, it's we want deliverance from the situation. He wants to help you in this situation. Not, not because he's cruel or mean, but he wants to actually teach you how to overcome the situation through his mindset. And as you partner with him, as you trust him, you actually grow in the purpose of God. And what you can't, what, what I've noticed is what you can't overcome in your own personal life, you sure won't overcome for people around you. So he, he's like, hey, let's break through this so you can help other people and so you don't live in deficit. God doesn't want li- anyone to live in deficit. Really, you know, and I think often what happens is people live in a particular area or several areas of their life with such as despair. The enemy gets them to commit, this is just the way it's going to be the rest of my life. And once, once he's gotten that thought process in you, he, he doesn't really have to fight you anymore. You've just accepted what he's allowed to, what he's done in your life. So don't ever accept a standard below by which you know God has called you to. So um, he, he really wants to help. So anyway, I say that because I have a book on there, Discipling Nations. Uh, last year, actually coming up on a year, and we're doing an, another two this coming year, 2020. There's a connection, and this is something I've learned personally and for land and for nations. It's this, that if something doesn't, if, if something gets started in one generation and doesn't get fully healed, it will follow the next generation and it will manifest in different ways. But unless you, but uh, you can identify that and heal that, you can move on. So there's a connection in America between the issue of abortion and slavery. And since slavery was never fully dealt with, we're dealing now with this shedding of innocent blood still. So if you're interested in that, it's called Healing the Land. And then um, talk a little bit about, I have a whole series on David. David is one of the most outstanding characters in the Bible. Like, if you don't like reading scripture, you need to get born again today. David is one of the few people you can read from one end of his life to another in scripture. First and second Samuel. Now, Chronicles has other parts of his life, but he's one of the few you can almost read from one end of his life to another. And Jesus is known as the son of David. And um, Jesus will sit, no matter what you think about the end times, Jesus is going to sit on the throne of David and judge nations, not the throne of Jesus. Think about that. And so, and then James, the brother of Jesus, says it in the Jerusalem Council that in the last days, God's going to rebuild the tabernacle of David. So if he's going to rebuild the tabernacle of David, he needs people like David. So we need to know about David. So... And I, I never re- I don't fully understand the whole throne of David thing, but this is one thing I'm sure of. God is not unaf- unafraid to identify with weak humanity. He's drawn to weak people. Like, he's not, I, I've learned with God, God is not all caught up in our issues because he wants to help you with them, you know? He, he's not like, oh man, I don't know what I'm gonna do with that. Oh, I totally screwed up. Oh, they, they got angry. It's like, he's like, I can help you. He's there to help. And the thing I think that, that really grieves the heart of God is wanting to help people, but them not, not wanting to get receive his help. It's one of the big things I've learned working with people. I, I, first of all, I'm not anyone's Messiah, thank God. <laughs> and secondly is, you can't want to help people more than they want to get fixed. So, and this is for someone in the room, Sometimes, often, God uses people that are close to us to constantly cause issues in our life or cause us to feel bad because they really don't want to get help. They just want to cause interruption in your life. And it's actually witchcraft. 
And when you put the, when you put the shield up of boundaries and emotionally go, hey, I'm not going to do this for you, then you're actually doing the will of God. It's not the will of God to get phone calls every night at midnight and be engaged in, in the, that's actually witchcraft. And it's disrupting your life. That's for somebody in this room. So, all right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for Global Harvest Church. We thank you for the city, this city that you're, you, you've called to be a city set on a hill. We thank you that this is, this is Bethel. This is the gate of heaven. This is the house of God. This is the place where angels ascend and descend on the Son of Man. And Lord, I ask uh, for words from heaven that shape earth. Words from heaven that shape earth. Words from heaven that shape earth. We thank you for the angel of revelation that's here. Lord, without you, I can't do anything, but with you, we can do all things. Give people ears to hear. Let the word be sown on good soil. Let it produce everything you've called it to produce. Let's just take a moment, just lean into him. There's something really wonderful about being intentional so let's just take a moment I just see like on my right as soon as I said that I just saw like this angel just breathing this breath of peace there's a rest of faith so where you felt overwhelmed just see just see like people at least one or two you just felt overwhelmed this week just receive the peace of the Lord someone with uh, depression. You just see Jesus, the fire of God's on your head. Be delivered of depression now in Jesus' name. It's like this oppressive thing. You have good days and then you go pretty well and then it's like you crash. And I just say be delivered today. Be delivered today in Jesus' name. Somebody's lower back, the Lord just healing somebody. It's actually just a fire of God. It's like a shooting pain you get. It's right in the middle of your back and the Lord heals you right now. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. I see this, um, this, this uh, staircase, right? In the middle of the sanctuary, almost right where this pulpit is. And it's going up into heaven. And the Lord says that there's a release of the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now this is connecting to something I saw in worship. I saw a door open in worship for this group of people here. It was the door into encounter that you've never known, into the beauty of the Lord as never before, and into a release of the spirit of revelation. And the Lord says that this will be known as a house of encounters as never before from this day forward encounter after encounter after encounter after encounter. I just see a, a picture, and it's like a picture of just people laying prostrate as the glory of the Lord just comes in this place. This will truly be a place of habitation, 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 habitation. And the Lord says there's been moments where the lightnings of God has come in, and there's been moments of visitation but the Lord says, I'm opening a door into an abiding presence in this room. And I see this, um, this angel, it's actually stationed outside and it's here to protect this land. It's here to protect the, uh, this group of people from defilement. And the Lord says, Psalm 91 is now your, your, uh, your verse of protection. The Lord says, I'm gonna protect what happens here and I'm gonna release a sound and a power from this room that will go to the very nations of the earth. And the Lord says, it's now I'm opening a door into a season, uh, a three to five year window of unprecedented expansion, expansion of people, expansion of resources and expansion of vision, expansion of people, resources and vision. And the Lord says, every time I called you to build something new, because you're an apostolic center, there'll be the resources to build. There'll always be more than enough to build. There'll always be more than enough to send people to the nations. There'll be always more than enough to plant other churches. There'll be always more than enough for schools and places of influence in, in this region and into the nations of the earth. Yet there's a key. There's a key that God is giving, a key of worship and intercession. Worship and intercession. 
and the worship and intercession will not be from a place of being overwhelmed, but f- playing, pr- nah, praying from a place of solutions. And that you'll actually just, through your worship and your declarations, you'll see, you'll see the manifestation of what I'm asking you to do. And I see uh, seven angels on assignment, on assignment to, that as you capture from a place of intimacy, capture from a place of intimacy, the Lord is saying they're going on assignment and they're going across the city and they're, not, they're, they're going across the city to begin to move in this city as never before because a door has been opened into the city and the Lord would say, open your mouth in this season because this is going to be a season of harvest. I'm going to open people's eyes to see the beauty of the Lord. I'm going to open people's eyes bound by religious spirits. I'm going to open people's eyes bound even by masonry. I'm going to open people's eyes bound, bound. But as you open your mouth, the Lord says, you'll see Uh, them come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I don't know why I'm saying this, but there's going to be some that thought they were saved, but when they hear, when they hear, they'll say, I thought I was saved for many years, but now I know that this is true. And sounds. I just see like um, these beautiful colors like rainbows, and I was trying to just discern what it was. And the Lord says, it's a spirit of revelation for the people in this room, revelation for breakthrough. And I see some of you, you've had many words over the last three and five years. And some of you, it's like there hasn't really, the, 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 the phrase I get, it's like the needle hasn't moved on those words. And the Lord says, this will be a season that if you lean into me, if you lean into me, if you lean into me, you'll have wisdom to break through through the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And the Lord says, this door that I'm opening begins this week for you. If you'll lean into the heart of God, I'll manifest myself in your home. I'll manifest myself in your workplace. I'll manifest myself as you go through day-to-day routines. The manifest presence of the Lord wants to come and abide with you as never before. For the Lord says you've been right to stand and you've stood and you've stood on the promises of the Lord and there have been times where maybe you thought, is this really God or have we lost our minds? The Lord says, I've been pleased with you standing. I've been pleased with you standing and the Lord says, now get ready because you're gonna break through into pioneering, into things in this city that I wanted when this city was founded but I, 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 it was always abandoned by people I brought here because of many different reasons. But the Lord says there is a sure foundation to break through and establish the kingdom of God as never before and leave a generational uh, legacy for the purposes of God in this city. And I want to give you, I want to give you other buildings in this city I want to give you other, the, the, I'm, I'm putting the foot on the gas, the Lord says. Accelerated growth. Accelerated growth in every area. But it, Hamas Shoka, the Lord says it's going to be from a place of rest. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Whew, that was wonderful. I felt from the Lord this morning to talk on this topic that I can't seem to get away from this year. It's uh, the topic of foundations. Uh, one of the things I'm continually lo- learning with the Lord is. Uh, Connecting with God and walking with God is not that complicated. There's a simplicity in walking with God, and if we relate to Him in the manner He wants us to relate to Him, we'll be, we'll, we will receive the fruit He wants to give us. And as much as you know, we cry, we pray, we want an outpouring. I do, I do. God wants it more. Yeah. He's just trying to get us to adjust to His ways and adjust to his timings and to adjust to his seasons. Uh, but 
even uh, foundation is the basis or groundwork for, for, for how a building rests upon. And if you uh, I've been learning about this for many years, and years ago I went to this contractor and I said to him, I said, tell me about foundations. And he said, oh, I don't mess with foundations. He said, if a foundation is flawed, I just, I, I've tried to fix them, and I just, I just start all over again. We just start the whole new foundation. And then uh, when I started revisiting this subject maybe about a year ago, I asked another contractor. Amazingly, about nine years later, or even almost 10 years later, more than that, 12 years later. I'm getting older, but I'm not aging. As the same, I said, tell me about foundation. He almost tells me the same exact thing. He goes, I don't mess with foundations. He said, it's just too much work. He goes, I just tell the people, let's start over and let's build a new foundation. So you cannot, uh, obviously, a building or a structure rest upon that foundation that's built. And I grew up outside New York City, about eight miles from the city. And one of the things I, learned, I, I observed was that they would say, we're breaking ground on this building, usually a skyscraper, and they, had, they usually had a, a rendering of what that building was gonna look like. And I've talked to my friend who's an architect, and he told me that any good architect, before a building is built, can tell you where every part of that building is supposed to be built. He said, if not, they're not worth their money. And so that building, before that foundation is ever started, there is a plan set in motion to know where every part of that, how every part of that structure is supposed to rest, where doors are supposed to be, where toilets are supposed to be, where whatever, closets, everything that building needs or it's intended to be, it is put to, it is in the mind or put on paper in the mind of that architect. So they have this rendering. I want to suggest to you that if a natural architect is supposed to know everything about a structure, how much more than the architect of our lives? He knew us before the foundation of the earth. I don't know how he does that, but he's beyond genius level. And he just knows. He put the day you the day you were born. He knew that day. That's the genius. Like, you know, your parents could have, or the two people who created you, they could have hated each other. He said, I'm going to choose this. And I'm going to give them as a gift to the world big thing about coming to the earth is no one comes to the earth without a purpose. Purpose is fundamental to human need. It's really important we know that because people are looking for purpose. You know, it's really true. He, he, he needed something done in the earth, so he brought you. He needed the earth managed. I was reading uh, Genesis 2 on the plane. And it's really fascinating about Jesus, and this uh, about God, and this is really important for your life too, is that it, he actually says in two verse four, he doesn't let the, the plants go or anything go until he puts man in it. He, part of humanity's purpose is to be a manager of what God creates. And one of the things I've learned too in walking with God is uh, I really evaluate asking God for things uh, in my life or asking him for certain things if I'm not able to handle or manage what's already in my hand. God, I, I, this is uh, for you, he's probably not answering some of your prayers right now is because he's, you're not sufficiently managing what is already in your hand. Like some people are like, I want a million dollars and they're like, God gives them a thousand and they don't even put 10% in the offering. It's like, why would I give you a million? I mean, he'd like to. It's not like he's broke. <laughs> but it's like, man, man, I, I, want, I want to give you like five million, but you're not a good manager. And your God is money too. I'm telling you, if you won't make God your money, he'll give you lots of money. You know, the God, money's not a big deal to God. <laughs> I mean, really, it really is. And by the way, the money is not in heaven. It's on the earth. It's really in the earth. It's called work, too. You know why I'm saying that. <laughs> so these buildings, one of the things I observe with these skyscrapers 
is that they would say, we started this building. Or my friend in Connecticut, he just finished a building last year. And I remember the first time I was on his property when they started, it was right next to the old sanctuary. And he said, hey, come see my building. And it's a big hole. I'm like, I thought you started the building. And I knew what was going on. They're building the foundation. And I remember as a child, even you drive by these buildings, they said they started construction. Sometimes for a year and a year and a half, they would build these foundations. And then, but here's the interesting thing. Once they finish that foundation, the rest of that building goes up in about seven months. Because they had to build the foundation. Had to build it correctly. And here's a a truth that's really important to to, uh, keep in mind. Every person here in this room, you are building your life in a certain way. Your life today is a result of choices and belief systems that you had yesterday. It's not, it's not like you're living your life in a vacuum. So everyone is building in a certain way. So the question is, is you building correctly? In fact, Paul, Paul there's several places, the epistles talk about it, Jesus talked about it. He said, take heed how you build. So... We, we, and, and I found that foundations, the reason I said that thing about simplicity is foundations are simply built by practicing the fundamentals. Wow. You, can't grow out, you can't outgrow the fundamentals, you know? And so I want to look at uh, Genesis chapter 1, where if you want to look at foundations, this will give you a good start. And um, when we're talking about foundations, of how God intended to relate to man and what, how God created the earth. Look at um, Genesis chapter 1. There's another uh, characteristics about God, too, in that he's a God that he operates in um, patterns and he operates in seasons. If the earth did not change seasons, the earth could not be as God intended it to be. And what I've learned is a lot of people can discern something that God said, but they can't discern the season to execute it because it goes back to fundamentals. I've learned that if, like, you can get, like, the greatest prophetic word ever, you're going to be awesome, you're going to be amazing, and you're awesome, and you're going to be way beyond what you're doing now, but if you don't have fundamentals in place, and the fundamentals is what bring you there, because I remember, I'm a person of a million questions, I was asking the Lord questions, he goes, he he took all the pressure off, off, you know, trying to be awesome, he just said, if you'll just stay in fellowship with me, everything you need to know, when you need to know, I'll let you know. I said, great, it's good. So I learned in the rhythm of fellowship with him, you discern the seasons. You discern the seasons of what he's asked you to do. So uh, God is a God of patterns and seasons. Look at uh, Genesis chapter one. When time began, God created the heavens and the earth. Notice that heaven is a created place. And what you also notice is that God God makes his home in heaven, according to Psalm 11. He sets up his throne in heaven. That's that's really important theological point because um, a lot of people are like, uh, they think that the only way that God is in the earth is through people. Put it that way. Okay, got really quiet there, but it's still true. But Genesis, Genesis, one time began, God created the heavens and the earth. God creates a place called heaven because he shows us where he'd like to live and where he is comfortable living. And then he creates the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. So really important there is you'll see that the earth is out of order, and the, or the, the, the earth is formless, and God has an intent in what he wants to create, and the Holy Spirit is there, but unless God speaks, his intention does not come to pass. The Holy Spirit can be in a room, but unless you often declare what God is saying, you won't uh, won't release what God wants to do. Uh, I remember years ago when I learned this principle, and it was in the Philippines, and it was like the first time I was there, and this village, and you know, it was really, tough place at the time, and, you know, I don't remember exactly what I started sharing that night, and I'm going, you know, I'm up there, you know, sharing something, going, they look like they're dead, and they're sleeping, and, uh, you know, uh, the Lord says, I'm going to give you a word, and as soon as I released this word, like, the lightnings of God came in, all these, the, 
all these pastors in this group. The next thing I know, they're all on the floor laid out and stuff. You caught what God was saying. And when you declare that, the presence of the Lord comes in. So you'll notice that God speaks what he declares, and then he, I always say this, he could have just told us he spoke, but he emphasizes a sermon. He speaks, he speaks, he speaks, he speaks, he speaks, he speaks, he speaks. He's teaching us how he creates through his speaking. So God, who, notice the pattern here, God is a three-part being, uh, Father, the, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons, one God. How does he make man? He makes man spirit. Most people say soul because they identify more with their soul than their actual spirit. So it's actually spirit, soul, and body. He makes man a three-part being. God is a three-part being. And what he desires and what he wants to accomplish, he uses through the language of his mouth. And his words make exactly what he desires it to, to make. And then there's... Uh, 26 through 29 are really key verses here. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the, over the birds of the air, over all the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Uh, first thing from that word image is the Hebrew word teshlem, which is basically like a, um, a picture of, He's saying there that he makes man in his image so man becomes a picture of what God looked like. Man was not a little God, but to see Adam was to see what God looked like in the earth. Wow. So he's God's representative, and then, and then he, he emphasizes again according to our likeness. Likeness is everybody, every person, even unborn again, has been given an aspect of God's personality. Why do we respect people? Why are we kind to people? Because everyone is made in the image of God. And, and in fact, if you want to describe Christianity as a religion, it's the only religion that recognizes the dignity of all people. Wow. Let them, notice the, too, that's also a key verse. Notice he doesn't say let us. He says let them. Let them. Let them. Let them. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds that the air over all the cattle, and then what are they over? Over all the earth, 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 over all the earth. And every creeping thing that creeps. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created male and female, he created them. Just as a side point there, one of the reasons, and this is not just in America, but this is all over the world, you're seeing an attack on the, the roles that God gives men and women is because once you confuse that, you confuse a whole society. Yeah. The foundation of healthy society is obviously a healthy family. So men and women, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So man has created the image of God. He's given the purpose of being a caretaker of the earth and he is given responsibility over the earth, and he is, uh, he, uh, he is given uh, stewardship of the earth, and, the, and the, the way he knows what he is created to do is that he hears the voice of God. The first voice that Adam ever hears is the voice of God. And you'll also see here that God, in, no, in none of these verses you see, he is not interested in setting up a religion. Nowhere in these verses will you find a religion being started. Go and start a religion. And you'll also notice that he's also interested in redeeming the earth and having the earth look like heaven. The other, you know, we, we see in Genesis 2 that he puts gold in the garden. We know another place where there's gold is heaven. So he puts part of heaven on earth and he tells man to manage that and extend heaven on earth. Wow. So he, he wants to, he, he's, God is establishing a kingdom. He's, he's putting man and woman as his ambassador. Now really key part about being an ambassador is an ambassador in countries. I was just in, in a meeting last week in Houston and there's a man there, he uh, he was from South Africa, but he went to Australia to plant a church, and eventually he became a citizen in Australia. And he said, you know, interesting thing about uh, being an Australian or becoming an Australian citizen 
is before myself and my children became citizens, we had to learn the values of Australia or else we could not become citizens. By the way, you can't just go there and say you want to be there. It's a different thought, but you get the point. Well, you Trump supporters. Anyway, so (laughs) I had to throw that in there. So he wants a kingdom. He has an ambassador. And if you know ambassadors today, if an ambassador is functioning properly, the ambassador when he is in a foreign nation, because that's what he's doing, he's representing this, uh, another government in a nation, and when he's in that nation, an ambassador never gives his opinion of what he thinks about something. He's there to represent the government. So they say, hey, what's, 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 your, uh, co- what's your opinion on what's happening in the Middle of the East? This is how he should respond, or she responds. The opinion of my nation is this. Well, what, what, is your, what does your country think about same-sex marriage? The opinion of my nation is this. He never is there to represent his own interest. He's an ambassador of ascending government. But everywhere he goes, the rules of his government apply to him. That nation's rules, if you know, they create a rule or something or a law or something, they don't have to apply to him because he's there as a guest of that nation. So God is interested in creating a kingdom, and he has an ambassador, and the first voice that he ever hears is the voice of God. And man was to receive knowledge from two separate sources. Number one was sensory knowledge. Sensory knowledge is very simply this. It's, it's uh, open up. five senses. Sight, hearing, touch, smell, taste. All God-given, all come through the realm of the souls. There's nothing wrong with them. They're God-given. So when Adam looks at those, looked at the earth, he goes, wow, this is really nice. It was perfect, so it was really nice. It was better than any resort you've been to. When he looked at Eve, he goes, oh, there's a fine woman. I like her. <laughs> Thanks, God. <laughs> eats, those, eats the fruit. It's perfect. It was really good. All God-given. Sight, hear, touch, smell. But there was another form and we just touched on a minimo, that voice that he hears, Adam can't look at himself and figure out what he's supposed to do. The reason I say that is what's very common. Look inside yourself. You know, find yourself. You do you. No, no, no. Don't do you, please. It's ruining the world. You doing you. It's humanism, philosophy. This is the, this is the defining thing right now in our culture. You'll notice it. A lot of people want to add biblical concepts to their spirituality, but they don't want Jesus at the center of it. Like, just forget, I, I, you know, take this fitness app and like all, this, all the instructions, like just leave the path behind, just let it go, just breathe it out. And it's all kind of biblical ideas, but they don't want to surrender to the king at the middle of it. So he receives knowledge from two sources. S- second place he receives information from is revelation knowledge. Adam cannot discover who he's created to be except through the voice of God and except if God tells him. What qualifies him to be who God's called him to be? The voice of God and his trust in the voice of God. Adam has free choice. Adam has something very, very powerful, something more powerful than the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's this, it's your choice. God can't, didn't make anyone come to church this morning, to this church building this morning, can't make anyone do anything. He can go, hey, do that, move on your heart, but he can't make you turn that engine key car, come down this church. The the power of choice is more powerful than actually the work of the Holy Spirit in the earth. So man is given the power of choice, but man is not created to be independent of God. He's got to make the choice. So what's a, what's, what's a foundational thing? Foundational thing is man has to choose to trust God, interchangeable with the word we know, faith in God. He has to put his faith in the words that God tells him in the garden to fulfill what God's called him to do. Also, you notice his, his, his understanding of how to operate in the earth is given through revealed knowledge. He said, You can eat of all these trees. Don't touch that one or don't eat from that one. Revealed knowledge. Even though what you'll see here is it look nice. 
So what you'll see is happening in the earth is that as Adam puts his trust in God, what he believes about God defines what happens in the earth because he's created to be God's caretaker in the earth. So keep that in mind. What you believe about God or what your belief system is defines the world that you live in today. Look at Genesis 2 now. Verse 19. This is a picture to me of how life in the kingdom of God functions. Out of the ground, the Lord from every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see, he, to see what he would call them. God, here's a foundational truth right here. God is always the source of all things. One of my favorite thousand verses, Romans 11. In him, to him, through him are all things. We don't do anything for God that resides within ourselves. Everything we, that's why, that's why we live these lives of worship. Because he goes, hey, I'd like you to take the earth for me. Great. And he goes, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the power to take care of the earth. I'm going to give you all the resources that you'll ever need to take care of the earth. But you'll have to choose to trust me to receive it. And you go, okay, I'll start doing that. He goes, oh, good. I'm going to reward you for what I gave you the power to do. It's a good kingdom. God never asks you to do something that resides within your own power or your own strength. Another part of this kingdom is that everything that Adam needed, he would find in God, and God would be his source as long as he trusted God. Adam was not looking at Eve and going, honey, how are we going to pay the light bill? It's coming into winter now, and you know the houses are getting expensive, and University of Oklahoma, how are we going to send these kids to school? Adam had no needs. God was his resource. So he's made steward of the earth, and so at God brings the animals to, to, bring, to him to see what he would name them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to all the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found the helpable comparable to him. So Adam is naming those animals, and what is he doing? We, the pattern is there. God speaks, God speaks, God. Adam, you're my representative. Now Adam is speaking the words of God in the earth. Those animals don't know the difference between God or Adam speaking. They just know I'm supposed to obey the word of God, so I will do what, those, what Adam is telling me to do. And we know biblically when you name something, you actually are prophesying part of its characteristics. Everyone should know what their name is. That's why God changed people's names. So they're like, oh, they got that one wrong. Let's change your name. <laughs> it's true because he, it's, your name is part of your prophetic identity. Wow. So Adam, as God's steward, is now speaking. And what is Adam doing too? He's putting his trust in what God told him. God told him, you're the caretaker of the earth. He didn't go to university. He didn't get a biology book. He can understand things. Why? Through revealed knowledge. Listen, you walk with God correctly, you will look brilliant. You have to realize, before you got born again, you were one step stored of really stupid. No, I'm serious. You have to think about yourself. That's why he teaches us one of the characteristics of the kingdom. Unless one is converted like a child, he cannot receive the kingdom of God. He's trying to re-educate the way you think. I remember years ago, being in college, having an encounter with the Lord my first year, I went on a wrestling scholarship. I did not go on an academic scholarship. By the time I finished, the people on academic scholarship were asking me questions. I, that's, not, that's, not, that's not my own brilliance. I'm telling you, you, I was losing my mind not walking with the Lord. I, I was forgetful Jones. Now my mind is good. Why? Because I got the mind of Christ. I got the wisdom of God. How are you doing that? I got the wisdom of God. You can do anything God tells you to do. Look at Genesis 3 now. Now, the, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the trees which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. 
And the serpent said to the woman, you, sh you, will, you will surely not die, for God knows in that day of it your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So obviously, the enemy comes, and some people think animals could talk before the fall. I think it's, I think probably true. But here comes, here comes a devil. He comes as a snake, and she begins to dialogue with someone she had dominion over. It's an important point. Don't dialogue sometimes with an entity you should have dominion over. And so uh, they ha they're having this dialogue, and what, the, the, let's see here. Verse five is really important, because he said, for God knows that in that day your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This truth has not changed in the earth today. You see it constantly. What is he trying to, what is he trying to entice you with? He goes, you're, you're the ambassador of the earth. God takes care of everything for you. But here's the thing. He's trying to get her to agree with the lie that he believed. Hey, you can, you can be like God and you can determine what happens in the earth. You can determine what you can eat from if you decide that same lie. You can be a God unto yourself. That's why this whole you do you thing, you know, just whatever you, you know, if, it, if you feel comfortable doing it, you're not hurting anyone, you just go do that. What is that? You're a God unto yourself. Same lie has not changed. It just changes different ways of delivery. Mm -hmm. And what, what, does, what does he challenge her with? He doesn't challenge her with revealed knowledge. You'll see the foundation of the world system right here. It's the realm of the senses. She starts looking, and in the, she, he's trying to get her to violate revelation knowledge through the realm of the senses. And that's the whole basis of the world system. Outward, 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 not inside. Kingdom of God, inside, out-minded. Gets her to agree, we know what happens. So you'll see that what humanity chooses to believe defines what happens in the world they live in because they were called to be the gatekeeper. Sensory knowledge overrode revelation knowledge and it caused them to see the world in a distorted way. That's key to figure out. That's why no one's ever come here, I guarantee it, never come to uh, Pastor Andy. He's like, Pastor Andy, please pray for me. I just want to give my whole paycheck away to the work of the Lord. It's really bad. I'm just so tempted. Why? Giving's a revealed thing. It's revealed knowledge. Or... Please pray for me. I just want to forgive everyone that offends me. What does your sense want to do? Kill him. <laughs> Vengeance is mine. I'll let it be mine. You take way too long. That's what I've told the Lord a few times. <laughs> you got to forgive him and be nice. No, I don't want to. That's, it doesn't feel right. It feels better when I get it, it, take it. So revealed knowledge is our gift to understand the world. So now, a system gets set, set up in the earth that God never intended. What's, what's that system? The world system. Don't think, you know, end time charts or anything like that. Just the world system is simply this. It's man's way of trying to make it in this world without God. What's my purpose? How am I going to pay the bills? You know, times are getting tough. What am I going to do? And the whole world system is meant to put pressure on you that you cannot handle stress, you know, I mean, there's like so many different, I mean, you go to like a, a self-help aisle, how to deal with stress, 20 days to deal with stress, you know, like, why? Because this whole world system puts pressure on you, you were, you were not meant to handle. And it blinds people, keeps them ignorant, keeps them on rolling in the same way. You ever know someone who works 80 hours a week, but they're still in the same financial state? That's what the world system will do for you. It'll keep you toiling and toiling and toiling and toiling until finally they're hoping that you give up. And even if you're quote unquote successful, they'll put even more pressure on you. Do you know that you can be successful in an area, but if you have the wrong thought process, it's actually destroying you? I know people who run 25 miles a week. 
They're in shape, but their whole belief system is messed up. They're running for a reason. It's not good. So one of the gifts that we're given is the ability from God when we become born again to begin to be re-educated to see the world as God intends us to see. In fact, in uh, John the 14th chapter, one of the characteristics of people in this world, what did he say? I will give you the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive nor can it see. So one of the goals of God when you come into the kingdom of God is to begin to teach you how to see correctly, to teach your belief system how to see correctly, to teach you to see the world correctly, to, to teach you how to navigate your, your, um, your destiny correctly. Jesus, this was a constant theme in Jesus' teaching. They, they come to him and they say, to, uh, teacher, it's a, great, it's a great question. What do we need to do to do the works of God? He didn't say, here's the five steps, how to do it. Go to the prayer line. Let me shiki haya haya you. It's going to all be good after that. But he said, this is the work of God, to believe in him who he sent. John 14, if you believe, not only are you going to do the works that I do, but you'll also do greater works. John 16, Mark 16, these signs will follow them that went to the school of healing. No, it says them that believe. He's trying to teach you how to see correctly. But now, there's a theme God is establishing here today. You can't build on those principles unless the primary pursuit of your life is seeking first the kingdom of God. The only, and the only deliverance from this world, here's what I learned, the only deliverance, complete deliverance from this world system is seeking first the kingdom of God. That's why there's a lot of frustrated people in believing, it, that, are, that love God with all their heart because they're trying to add God to their paradigm and God is not the center of their paradigm. He, he, he tells us in this discourse in Matthew 6, right? He says, don't worry, don't do this, don't do this. And then he goes, but seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Here's the center of it. Look at uh, Matthew 22. It's only 12 o'clock. Okay. Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Look at the pattern here too. The second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Notice he, he teaches us there that you can't love the world correctly unless you're loving God correctly. So what's one of the fruits? Like you can say, I oh my God's first, God's first. So what's one of the fruits that God or the kingdom of God, God's way of doing things is really number one in your life? Number one, are you poor in spirit? What's the result of being poor in spirit? You recognize your deep need for God. And how you recognize your deep need for God is do you have a fellowship with God? Have you taken personal responsibility for your own spiritual development? If you have, then you usually have a lifestyle fellowship with God. There's something very interesting that I observed in the last year with Jesus interacting with his disciples. He has no corporate prayer meetings. His life of fellowship with God was in the morning, he prayed at night. You saw him praying all the time. So what does it teach us? By the way, Jesus is the first man since the original Adam to express what God intended for Adam. Everything you see in, in Jesus is what God intended for Adam. And Jesus, the model for spirit-led living, had a lifestyle of fellowship with God. Why is that so important? Because it's out of, see, we often, we are looking many times, especially in our own movement, we're, we're, we're looking for the fruit of foundational trust. Like, how do you hear the voice of God? Very simple. Here it is. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Make an intentional, and I've learned I've had to do this after 25 years. I have to make a choice almost every week. I almost do it. I, I put my journal out, take communion, and I go, God, I need your help. And with your help, I once again commit to putting you first, fellowship with you first, your word first, your voice first. It's 
foundational to everything you do. Because if you have a fellowship with God and you have a sincere desire to know what he wants to do, you'll hear his voice. I've never met anyone who's done that. I just don't know what he's saying. I'm just having trouble. Why? Because the words of Jesus are true. He said, anyone who desires to do my will will know that my doctrine is from God. What's he saying? If you really want to know what he wants to say, he's going to let you know. I remember years ago on this journey of, of wanting to know the voice of God. You know, I sit in the back of my friends. He's having this church celebration. And I'm just starting. It probably wasn't the first time, but I knew I, wanted, I just wanted to do whatever God wanted me to do. He said, Abner! Abner! And I'm going, I think this is the Lord. Abner! And I did what all good charismatics do. I need confirmation. <laughs> you know, we laugh, but he's okay with that. He's okay when we're starting to learn his voice. Now, he goes, I think this is, I don't think God put it for me. How come? Why? Because he knows we know now. He knows that we've come, we've, we've been accustomed to know his voice. And now he expects us to act. Look at, um, let's go through a few things here. Look at, um, Luke 4. Verse 16. So he came to Nazareth when he'd been brought up as was his custom and he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and he stood up to read and it was handed him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And he opened the book and he found the place where it was written. I want you to notice too that Jesus is coming into alignment through the words he speaks. He's coming into alignment with the prophetic word over his life. How much more do we need to come into alignment with the prophetic words over our life? That's one of the ways you know you've actually received what God has said. And it's also one of the ways you get delivered of all the mindsets that are preventing you from fully receiving that word. And you're like, you're going to be amazing. You're like, I can't say that. Okay, let's figure out why you can't say that. Because there's something internal that God wants to deliver you of you so you can receive what he'd like to give you. I'm right. I'm so right on that. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Notice there, he says liberty to the captives. He's articulating this principle that when you are outside the kingdom of God, you are bound to the system of this world. We need to really think about that as believers, I think. Because sometimes, I know there's nice people outside the kingdom of God, but sometimes we're like, oh, they're, you know, they're so nice. No, they're, they're blind. They're blind and they're bound and they need what we have. to proclaim liberty to the captives, so that's brilliant. God wants us as free as him. I'll say that again because it confused some of you. God wants you as free as him. God has no issues. God's got no hang-ups. God's got no childhood trauma. He's that free. And he wants you that free. We've got one person. That we got, we'll work on her. Thank you. Thank you for receiving that. And he makes this statement, to recovery of sight to the blind. So you're ca you're, when you're locked into the system of this world, you can't see or perceive correctly. And then he tells us, look at Matthew 16. He tells us how he's going to open our eyes to see and perceive correctly. Look at Matthew 16. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But he said, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, catch this part, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. What's he telling them? The realm of the senses did not give you this information. But my Father who is in heaven, and also I say to you, you are Peter, 
and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So he says, on this revelation, and I think he's making two points here. He's saying, on the revelation that Jesus Christ is Lord, will I build my church, but I also think he's making another point. On revealed knowledge will I teach them about the kingdom of God. So here's how I've learned this functions. You come into the kingdom and the foundation, you've got to build that foundation on felt. No one can have a relationship with God for you. Here's the other thing I've learned. If you don't build your life on finding your deepest needs met by God, you are finding it somewhere else. You're finding it. You could be even. You could be like the greatest miracle worker. I'll be. I'm going to tell you the truth. Some of the most insecure people are some of the most powerful people in the earth. Oh Lord Jesus, you feel exhausted after talking to them because they will tell. And it's awesome what they're doing. I think. Like I almost want to say, I think you're amazing. Before you started telling me every, how amazing you were. <laughs> I like you. You're awesome. I give offerings because I believe in what you're doing. You're amazing if we don't find it right here. You came from God. Deep desire for you to know where you came from. So you start here. And then what what did Jesus teach? He taught us this beautiful principle. He teaches, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So he says, you gotta hear just like you eat what I'm saying but he gives us truth in degrees. He doesn't just like unload everything. Like I think if he told you all the trouble you'd walk through, at least me too, like no way. I'll stay in Japan. (laughs) He just, notice with Joseph, he just gives him the dream. He doesn't tell him all the opposition. He's just going, you're going to be amazing. (laughs) But here's the other part he's trying to teach him. He's trying to teach him to be governed by revelation knowledge, not by the circumstance because your belief system is supposed to define your world. So I'll just give you an example for man. So, and he also tells us in Matthew 7, he said, the man who's building his house on the rock is not only hearing, but doing. He can't build unless you're hearing and doing. The most dangerous thing to do is hear week after week after week and never do anything. So I'll just give you an example from my own life. Math, uh, 1996, fall 1996. I'm in a meeting. Never desired to be a ministry. I thought preachers were strange, especially traveling ones. Who, like they all lived in RVs. <laughs> I don't like RVs. I don't know why people go camping for fun. I like Hampton Inn, baby. They're like, they're like you want to go out in the wilderness with us for like four days? No, no. I want to sleep on a pillow. I like internet. I like to stream movies when I'm relaxing. There's none of that out there. So the traveling preachers, they all, and they all made their kids wear the same clothes. And they put them up there to sing, even if they couldn't sing. How many of you know you grew up like that, right? I was at a conference a few weeks ago telling that story, and the guy in the front row his, fam- his dad was a very well-known Assembly of God evangelist, and he had the, he wore the same clothes as brothers and sisters, and he sang. So I'm not exaggerating. But it's just the truth. But I'm in this meeting as a college freshman, and the man, I always remember, somebody actually told me they ran into him, preaches this message that night. He says, teach, what I remember him telling this story about these young people who preached the gospel in a Muslim nation and they would beat them with rods and they would throw them out of the village. But they were so committed to preaching the gospel, they came back and they would beat them with rods. And I remember thinking to myself, because of, I know because of the environment I grew up in, I knew that if I didn't make a choice to surrender my life to God that night, somehow my life was not going to end up how God intended it. So I, you, you, you know if you've been around the body of Christ. And I was sitting in the back. So that's what you do when you're backslidden and chasing girls. That's what you do. You sit in the back. But I knew. Not you, just me. 
that's me. That's what I did. I, I remember. He said, if you want to surrender your whole life to Jesus tonight, no matter what, you may have said a sinner, but I remember as soon as I stood up, it wasn't I felt anything, I didn't sense anything, I just knew. I knew from that moment forward I was called to preach the gospel. I saw in a moment of time me preaching the gospel in nations of the earth. I saw the power of God displayed in a general. Literally, my whole life changed one moment. The whole compass of my life changed. But catch what happens. It's only through surrender. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be a lawyer. But I really, I've never, ever regretted saying yes to the Lord because he's smarter than I am. Immediately, I saw that. The next day, I'm walking through campus, it's like I can see better. So that's revealed knowledge that gives me purpose. Here's something really interesting. He doesn't talk to me about my ministry for many years. Very little, he says to me. I go, what am I called to do? But you know something else that happened? A seed, a strong seed went in me for a hunger for God and for the supernatural. Like, I just couldn't get enough of seeing God move. Like, I'd go anywhere. Like, people like, oh, you know, the boys had a soccer game so we couldn't come to the Holy Ghost meeting. I used to drive seven hours, so I don't understand that. If you're really hungry for something, you'll go after it. Like, well, you know, we had to do the yard on Sunday. Okay. Can God touch him in the yard? Yeah, but he was moving in that building. I start. I go, what am I called to do? He goes, I want you to be my friend. No, no, what am I called to do? I'm going to be amazing, right? Show me what I'm going to I want you to be my friend. Another step forward. And I want to suggest I, I, I got it all right. I made lots of mistakes, but revealed knowledge. About a year later, I walk into this church that I'm still a member today, close with the pastor, some of my greatest supporters. He goes, this will be where you get trained. Another step forward. At one point in there, he said, do not miss a service in this season in your life because you need what's coming out. Another step forward. What's happening? I don't know it, but my, in, my outside is starting to be defined by my inside. I walk into this place, I walk into this church to help them with a summer camp. This guy goes to me. He, when, you, when you're carrying something from the Lord, the favor of God and the supernatural opens uncommon doors for you. This is not just in ministry, but this is every area of your life. When you are on assignment, God is moving things on your behalf. Trust me. This guy goes, I want you to be my intern. I didn't want to be his intern because he was feminine. You know, it's true. I'm 21 and you think you know everything. You know, just... But here's, here's the part, the safety. Counsel will save you. So I went to my... He goes, I think you should do it. I said, I don't like you. Should, have you met this guy? He's, you know, like a little funny. And I wanted to serve my church. He goes, another step forward. Now, here's the awesome thing that happened. This is really awesome. I was anointed, and I knew it. <laughs> so the first Sunday I'm there, God, he lets me share a little bit, and God shows up. He never let me come back to that pulpit again. It was awesome, one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. Got to work on inside. He said, we're going to let you work with the children. Great. I'm going to do my best with the children. Another step forward. Some part in there he tells me to go to graduate school. You don't know what God's asking you to do in the moment that always p preparing you for the next step. I go to nations today, they wouldn't let me in unless I had an advanced degree. I don't know that completely, but a lot of times, what are you here? Oh, I'm a teacher. Oh, really? You have a degree? Yes, here, I can show you. Another step forward. When I'm in graduate school, I work for this man that didn't like me. Actually, he hated me. And I was in a very valued position, graduate assistantship. Not a lot of people get those. Again, I never applied for it. He just gives it to me. And I thought, praise the Lord. God is opening a way. Oh, he was opening a way for me to discover things about myself I didn't know. Way back there, all through that time, you don't want to move by the realm of senses. Brownsville, Toronto. I'm going, God, I can go train for ministry and be awesome. He goes, that's not what I have for you. I have the school of the Holy Spirit. And I was very excited until I started the school of the Holy Spirit. So I didn't know he wanted to kill me in the process. Really what he wanted to kill was all the stupid parts about me. He's still killing all the stupid parts about me. 
So I go, I, I'm in this position. You know, you think you're something because you got a degree now. You're like, 23, I got a college degree, and I'm smart. And a week after, I, I'm not exaggerating, this man did not like me. And about a week and a half into the job, I remember I got home to the place, little farmhouse I was living at the time. I said, God, I don't need to take this. You know, when you think you're being spiritual, but you need a Holy Spirit spanking? You got the diaper on, and you're the only one that knows it. And I heard the Lord say, I still rem- see, when you're sincere, you'll hear his voice. He said, that's right, you don't need to take this, but if you don't stay in the you're not going to do in your heart what I want to do. I said, the devil is a liar. I did. I'm serious. I was like, I don't want to stay here. So I went to a pastor on staff, explained how bad it was. Oh, I told him how bad it was, how I was being abused, you know. And I think it's because of my skin color. You know, I threw that one in there too, you know. You make yourself a victim of everything, you know. Not you. And he goes, you know what? That sounds rough, but I think you need to stay. I said, the devil is a liar. <laughs> Big church, so I found another pastor on staff. <laughs> I'm serious. I was very So, um, you know when you're, you know I've learned that? You will find someone that will eventually tell you what you want to hear if you keep going to enough people. So we had a big church. Still today do. And one of the things the, the senior pastor did, who's like a father in my life today, he would stay after service and talk to everyone who wanted to talk after the second service. Sometimes he'd say, I was, so I'm going to tell him. He's going to tell me to leave because he surely he wouldn't want me abused like this. And he, he stops and he goes, you need to stay in this job. I said, the devil is a liar. So I went to my dad. I did. I told him how bad it was. I laid it in for 20 minutes. And he goes, how long have you signed up for? I said, well, until I finish my degree. He goes, sometimes in life, we should follow through on our commitments. And this is tough, but I think that you need to follow through on your commitments. So finally, I obeyed the Lord. I never thought of myself as a violent person until I started this job. Things were, back then it, they called it postal, right? I didn't want to kill everyone, just one. Just one. Just one. One person. But you know what? It wasn't the outside. The outside was just exposing things that God had to deal with in my heart. Because I was, I was from New Jersey. I had a prophetic gift that I didn't even know I had. I was black and white. All this is not for a good personality when it's not tempered correctly. Before that, I used to, I just like, if I didn't like you, I was just like, oh, that's a, that's a nice shirt, Andy. You're looking a little heavy in it. That's how, that's how I just would function. <laughs> like, and I wasn't being mean, I was just being honest. They're like, I don't know why they don't like me. I just told them the truth, you know? <laughs> I'm serious. I was, I was, it was an example, it's not, not being truthful, it's an example. Yeah. <laughs> so you're prophetic when you don't even know it. So. I ha- honestly, I, d- I figured, I found out there was a lot of garbage in there that I needed deliverance from. I finished that position. I literally cried on the last day because it was so hard. Listen to what happened, though. I finished my degree early, so that was good. You're motivated when you don't like where you're at to finish quickly. <laughs> Twelve credits in one semester. It about killed me, but I got it done. Six months later, this man in my church who traveled all over the world, he said, I'd like you to come be my traveling assistant. So, it was the first job I ever had in ministry. And I was very naive, Andy. I thought, if you were in ministry... It meant you were whole. No, it just means you're called. (laughs) And the first job I ever had in ministry was about a hundred times as hard as the job of working in that graduate school. And if I had not stayed in that position, I probably would not be in front of you today because I learned things that saved my life, even though it was one of the most challenging environments I was ever in. So what does he do? He builds truth. And that's that's just my purpose. I can tell you, Revealed knowledge after revealed knowledge after
after revealed knowledge, after revealed knowledge, after revealed knowledge. I can tell you um, about um, nine years ago, I got invited to this meeting in Ohio. And I read the email, I was like, nah, I'm too busy. I don't have time to go to this. And um, about a day later, see, if you talk to the Lord, he'll set you straight. He said, you don't decide where you go. I tell you where to go. And I want you to go to the meeting. Apparently, we're going to the meeting now. <laughs> and in that meeting, God opened the door for me. I didn't even intend it to whole stream of leaders, but also, more importantly, connected with one of the, my, my personal intercessor today, who we've seen some of the greatest breakthroughs since she's come on board and developed a whole team of people who pray. Revealed knowledge. And there's a danger, too, in not growing in knowledge because where you cease to grow, you will not fully see as God wants you to see. And here's another thing. We're all on this journey. Let's finish this. We'll land here. I know I went a while, but I only got one shot with you guys. It's only 12, 24. You started early. He gave me it early, too. So look at the very next story. Of, in Matthew 16. So here you have Peter nailing it out of the park. He nails it. Very next story. I think it's very, very intentional here. Verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes to be killed and raised on the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, for this shall not happen to you. Notice that Luke 14, he tells us he came to set the captives free and he came so we might see. Paul teaches us we see through the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That's why he tells us in Proverbs, without revealed knowledge, the people of God perish. So you have access to all things, but what things revealed knowledge does is it opens your eyes to see what you can't see, but opens your eyes to the blind areas in your life. What you don't know, you don't know. And what you don't know, you'll stay blind. Often, it's, it's very painful for me, sometimes in other countries, especially with other leaders, you're talking to them and you realize they don't have certain information or understanding about God that could have brought them into breakthrough 20 years before that. But what you, this is why it takes great humility and discipleship is always in the context of community because when you have people around you, they can help you with your blind spots. Now, here's a common one. The people who say, I'm good, I'm fine, those are the ones who need the most help. I'm good, I'm good. No, your wife knows you're not good, your children know you're not good, your pastor can't stand you, everybody knows you're not good, but you're good. I love the Lord. Shut up behind the fuck about you. No, no, you're not good. Get help. Then he he took Peter aside and he said, Far be it from you, Lord, for this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you're an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. This is what it's like to walk with Jesus, what I've learned. You're like, he's like, awesome, Abner, you hit it out of the park with that one. Revealed knowledge, A plus in that class. And then he starts talking to you about other things. Jesus starts going, and it's messing with Peter's paradigm. He goes, no, 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 no. You know, you're supposed to take over as king. We're supposed to get, we're supposed to get back at those people who tax us too much. I'm going to deal with those people who took advantage of me in the fishing business. And, and I'm, you know, I'm going to be on your staff. It's going to be awesome. We're going to make Israel great again. And now Jesus is revealing things about himself that does not fit Peter's paradigm. Even though in one place, he's totally nailed it. He got an A plus over here. This is why it's a danger. Just because you're doing well in one area doesn't mean you have it all together. And it's a danger. He's like, oh, I'm fine. I'm anointed. I'm doing awesome. But you're completely blind in another area. And he tells him, what does he tell him? He goes, 
you're th- you're basically, he tells me, you're thinking like the world system and like the devil in this other area. And unless you shift, you're the one who's out of bounds in that area. That's why he prayed, Paul prayed, that the spirit of wisdom and revelation would come so that your eyes, your, you don't think from here, you think from your heart. Think from your here, right here. This is where decisions are made. This is where your life is defined. That's why he tells you, guard your heart with all diligence. Why? Out of it flow the issues of life. Why does he teach? Why does he teach? He goes, he goes you've heard it said, if a man commits adultery, he's committed to, he goes, he goes, but I say to you, if a man looks at a woman to commit adultery, why? Because he knows if you don't repent of it, you're eventually going to do it because it's in your heart to do. Receive this word. Father, we thank you. Mm. If you just receive this word, I just encourage you to just lift your hands. Spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We just ask it to come. Thank you, Lord. Mm. I just see. Jesus just unlocking people's ears to hear this morning. Ears to hear and eyes to see. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just receive your word today and I bless your people in this season of revelation in the earth, to hear your voice over and over and over again. I just want to encourage you, if you just, maybe you've done it many, many times, but if you just want to make a fresh commitment to seek first the kingdom of God, one, two, three, just stand on your feet. that, just lift your hands and just say, Father, with your help, I choose to put your kingdom first. I choose to make my highest delight you. I want to know you, and I want to hear your voice. God will just speak all across this room right now. Wherever you need to make adjustment, he'll just speak. There's a door of encounter and there's a door of revelation opening to the people of God in this room. There's people in this room you are going to get dreams about this city that would unlock this city. Wisdom and revelation. Some of you have miracle gifts and God is going to teach you how to unlock those gifts in a dimension you have not known. This will be a house of a gathering of eagles as never before. Andy, I see this picture of like, you have like this board here and I just see people just sharing prophecies and you apostolically just putting them in of how you're going to walk these prophecies out. The Lord says you're going to walk the prophecies out. You're going to see the dry bones be raised up. And I have this sense that this is going to be like a model city for the purposes of God. How did you break through? How did you break through? And you say, it's going to be through revealed knowledge from heaven. We got the blueprints of heaven and we followed it. And God has been faithful. We got the blueprints of heaven and God has been faithful. We got the blueprints of heaven and God has been faithful. And I see, whoa, whoa. Just see this oil, oil, just oil. There's a fresh being released oil from heaven, God. 
We receive the oil from heaven today. Oil from heaven. Amen. Amen. Just want to say one more thing. Just look up here if you would. Just want to say, I believe that God is very pleased with this group of people here. And uh, tomorrow night we'll take time and minister to everyone, but I feel like my assignment is done this morning. So thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Wow. So awesome. Amen. I'm going to have to chew on those words a while. Uh, Many, many confirmations in those things. So praise God. Let's take an offering for Abner, and uh, this offering will go all to him. So, and we're just really thankful. And if you want more tonight, or not tonight, you know, more tomorrow night, <laughs> don't come tonight. Don't come here, right? Uh, but if you want more tomorrow night, uh, come at 630. And, uh, of course, Abner will also be doing chapel tomorrow for Global Harvest Christian School. So we just have great expectation for what the Father's going to do. So, Father, we just want to thank you today, Lord, for that, that the prophetic word, the message, Lord, all those things. Lord, teach us to be doers of the word. Teach us to be those who pursue you. And, Lord, all the things that you spoke this morning, we just say yes and amen. And we thank you, Lord. We just, even as a body of believers, we sow into Abner today, Lord, because of what you're doing in him, what you're doing through him. Father, we just thank you today. We bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. So you guys just go ahead and take that. You can make checks payable to Global Harvest Church, um, and it will, will write, run, write one check to him. Also, be sure and pit and check out the resource table. Amen. Uh, check those things out. Some great resources. And uh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Bless you guys. Get ready for the Arctic blast tomorrow. You just never know in Oklahoma, right? Pressure changes often cause babies to be born, so cash. That pressure change, yeah. Her faith just, I, did you feel it? It just rose up, right? So, <laughs> and all y'all on the back row, I had to look and see who's on the back row. Chasing women, Frank, right? Hallelujah. Look out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if you, do, if you, I'm gonna have to dismiss, right? <laughs> if you do need prophetic ministry, yeah, we will have a prophetic team here. If you need some prayer for healing, we'll have a healing team here. Praise God. Thank you guys for coming. Have a great day, great week, and we'll see you. God bless.